Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that we are called by your name, Lord. We thank you for your word. Um, your word is a um, double-edged sword, um, sharper, Lord, um, able to divide the bone and marrow. Lord, div- uh, questioning the intentions of man's heart, Lord. And Lord, we come to you under your word. We pray that you would teach us so that we can um, be equipped to run the race and serve you with our whole life, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we are continuing our study in Hebrews. Uh, We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. And chapter 4, verse 1, it's, um, at, uh, it's in the middle of a, the warning uh, we saw last time. And it's going to continue with exhorting the people of the recipients of this letter and telling them to stay faithful to God. But if we read from verse 7 and as a way of a recapitulation of what we saw. Are we going to do that real quick? Um, so let's read from verse 7, from verse seven in chapter 3. Um, remember, verse 7 to 11 in chapter 3 is uh, it's a reference to Psalm 95, verse 7 to 11 as well. <clears throat> Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Remember, the author attributes the, the authorship of the Bible to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Um, all scripture is breathed out by God, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Um, 2 Peter 1, men moved by the Spirit. They wrote <clears throat> the Word of God. So the author of Hebrews doesn't say David says, but he says the Spirit of God said. So attributing the the authorship of the Bible to uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, Today, if you hear his voice, the word today marks urgency. Right now, don't postpone it to tomorrow. Right now, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. If you hear his voice, The gospel call, when the gospel is is being preached, it's God speaking to the messenger, and you need to respond to that call. Um, In Psalm 95, it was a worship to, it it was a call to worship, uh, to bow down before the Lord, before Yahweh, our maker. Um, So these Jews, the recipient of the book of Hebrews, um, they heard the gospel, through Jesus Christ, even though the author says um, they receive it from either an apostle or someone who was a witness of Jesus Christ, but ultimately it it is the Lord Jesus Christ talking to them. Hebrews 1.1, in these last days God has spoken to us through his son Jesus Christ. So today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Verse 9, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Rebellion, if you read back in, in Psalm 95, it's that word Meribah. And testing is that word Mesa or Masa. On that day, the people were thirsty. And Moses told them, why are you putting the Lord to the test? By saying, is the Lord among us? You know, at this point, um, they saw the mighty hand of God. God sent the ten plagues um, to Egypt and freed them from slavery and Pharaoh and his tyranny. God parted the Red Sea, provided the cloud by day and a fire by night to guide them through the wilderness. Um, God provided manna 
bread from heaven to feed them when they were hungry. And that day of testing, they were thirsty. And uh, they were asking, after all this thing, is the Lord still among us? And eventually, the Lord was provoked in his anger when they sent the 12 spies to spy the land to see what is that land of Canaan about? And when, that, when they returned, they gave a bad report. And the people were like, oh, we do. We, like, we all like grasshoppers before these giants. And the Lord says, they spied the land for 40 days. You guys are going to spend 40 years, one year for each day, they spied the land. Only Caleb and Joshua gave a good report. But the other 10, they caused the people to sin. And despite of all the, what the Lord had done for them, they would not believe in him. And that's what we saw last, last time. Beware of unbelief. Do not um, abandon the faith. Fight the good fight. Stay faithful until the end. The Lord says in Deuteronomy 29 verse 5, I have led you for 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out of you, out on you, and your sandals have not worn off of your feet. It's like the Lord took care of them. We change clothes maybe every, I don't know, house, household or different. Me, I, every year. Some people every three months. Some people once they wear the, their dress and they send it somewhere else. So it's like, but the Lord for 40 years kept them, protected them. Still, they would not believe in him. They were constantly in need of a miracle. And this is the warning. People all, who are always chasing after miracles, they are displaying a lack of faith, a lack of, or an absence of faith even. We have some so-called Christian circles. I don't want to name them. <clears throat> they always want a miracle. They want a miracle today. They want it now. Lord, I don't know, fill this room and shake this room. Yes, that, we're going to see that there's a time when they pray like that. But... Um, they are displaying a lack of faith because they want something to like, stimulate them. I don't believe in God. Oh, now I believe, you know. It's, it's a lack of faith. <clears throat> Jesus said to an official in Galilee, unless you people see a sign, you would not believe. In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, tongue, they are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers, right? Signs and wonders are for unbelievers. So, People always seeking sign, wonders, miracle. They're looking for the famous prophet in town. Where, where, where is he going to be in town? I'm going to go there. Healing, blessing. You're showing that you have no faith. John Piper said in one of the, um, I forgot the name of the article. He says, uh, sign seeking is a diversion from the power of Christ crucified. You're looking at the stuff, but you're not looking at the real thing, Christ, the substance. That's what you need to put your faith in. So they are always seeking for a sign. Um, and they need a stimulant to help them believe again and again. Um, and Jesus said, an adulterous and wicked generation seeks for a sign, but none will be given to, to, to her except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So they need to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what they need. They don't need miracle. They don't need um, stimulant. But on the other hand, I, I am not saying the Lord is not working wonders in the life of his children, right? Um, God is sovereign. Sign and wonders, they have a purpose. They attest to the um, authenticity and the veracity of the word of God. Jesus said, if you don't believe my word, believe on the account of the works of the sign, uh, because the Pharisees would reject him over and over again. Um, so my point is, we need to have that balance. We need to trust God that he can work miracles. When we pray for our children to be saved, it's a work of miracle. Like the Lord needs to change that heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh that is able to worship God and keep his commandments. When we pray for missionaries in, in other places, they are in the forefront of the battle. They, have, they, 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 are, they are going under 
um, so much spiritual attack, we need God to intervene for them. I, I heard the story. There is, um, there, is a, there is a little village on the mountain, and this, this, this missionary was pressed upon like, by the Spirit. I need to go to that mountain. For some reason, the Lord was guiding him. And when he got there, there was a sister in that village. They poisoned her because she was a Christian, and they wanted her to die. And when they came, they provided, um, 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 they, they provided um, medicine, and she was healed. And that caused the village, all of them, to repent and trust in God. So the Lord works wonders. He is mighty. So they have a purpose. It's to cause us to believe in him, uh, to attest to the word that Christ is the Lord. So we need to have that balance. And last week, I think Brother Chris was like, touching on that um, in, in chapter 4 in Acts, um, when they prayed for boldness to preach the word of God. Um, and they said, Lord, that you would stretch out your hand and heal, and that sight and wonders are made in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a place we pray for that. Um, but, Lord, I need a sign. It's like a remote control. Lord, now. Lord, now. No, it's not like that. That shows that you don't believe God. Verse 10. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go straight in the heart. They have not known my ways. The word provoke, that means vexed or offended. When someone offends you, um, when you're angry with something, or when you are displeased with something, you're offended. Um, some of you know this little thing about me. Sometimes I don't like when people say, are you sure? I'm getting used to it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a type of politeness. But imagine like the Lord says, I'm going to take you guys from Egypt to the promised land. Moses came. Who are you, Moses? I was like, the Lord sent me. And when Pharaoh like, increased their labor, oh, Moses, you came for a doom. It's like saying, God, are you sure you're going to do this thing? God said, yes, I'm going to do it. And he sent the ten plagues. And they got out of Egypt. They got to the, the, the Red Sea. Oh, is it because there were not any tomb in Egypt you came here so that we can die in the wilderness? Lord, are you sure you can do this thing? Yes, the Lord parted the sea. But it's like you see like this unbelief like continually like building to a point where the Lord was provoked in his wrath. And he says, no more. You guys are going to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until all that generation, only two persons, like Caleb and Joshua, they, they entered the land. But everybody else, any, anybody of age in that generation, they died in the wilderness. So um, verse 12, take care, brothers, let there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. This warning against allowing an unbelieving heart, a hardened heart, a sinful heart to cause you to, to fall away from God, to be apostatized, like abandoning your faith. Um, fall away, that means to turn away from God, to forsake God, abandoning your faith. In Luke 8, 13, in the parable of the sower, he says, and the ones under the, under the rock are those when they, heard, when they hear the word, they receive it with joy, but these they have no root. They believe for a little while, and in time of testing, they all fall away. So these, these Christian Jews in this time they wanted to leave the faith. They wanted to go back to the old ways, the, 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 Jew, Jew, um, the Jewish system. Um, 2 Timothy 4.1 uh, talks about men who will be departing from the faith. They wanted to leave Jesus Christ and return to the old sacrificial um, economy. This warning is a call 
to repentance, to turn away from that hardened heart and to trust in Jesus Christ. You want to return? News flash. Falling away from Jesus Christ is falling away from God, from the living God. You think you're going back to God? No, you're falling away from God, actually. But glory be to God, whenever there is a warning, the Bible also gives us like helpful tip, like how to uh, walk, how to like be encouraged in our faith. So verse 13, but exhort one another every day, as long as is it called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The author is striking at the heart of the matter. The problem is sin. I think it was Brother Chris again. He was saying, like, sin is so deceiving that he caused an angel of light, the angel of light, Lucifer, to think that he can take the place of God. And he was cast out of heaven. And he became our foe, our enemy. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, also says, Therefore, let no one who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall we we need to take heed and not underestimate the power of sin sin can tell you hey this momentary pleasure is the best thing but we need to be on guard we need to be watchful uh, and not give in so the root of the problem is sin and that sin leads to unbelief and unbelief eventually leads to punishment. They suffer the wrath of God. Eventually, for anyone who have a heart of unbelief in our day, like if you continue that route, you're going to suffer the wrath of God, eternal punishment. And he says, exhort one another. You know, the Bible has so many one another's. I have listed like 12 of them. I'm just going to maybe give you the verse, and when you get home, you can read them. So we have love one another, John 15, 12, Romans 13, 8. Most of them are in Romans, actually, and today we're going to start with Romans, which is awesome. Serve one another, John 13, 14, Christ um, washed the feet of the disciple. Galatians 5, 13, Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burden. Pray for one another, James 5, 16. Build up one another, Romans 14, 19. Be humble toward one another, Romans 12, 10, Romans 12, 16. Forgive and forbear one another, Ephesians 4, 2, Ephesians 4, 32. Do not judge one another, Romans 14, 13. Be honest with one another, Ephesians 4, 25. Maintain unity with one another, Romans 15, 5. Be at peace with one another, Mark 9, 5, I'm sorry, Mark 9, 50. Romans 14, 19. Show affection to one another. Romans 16, 16. Kiss each other with a holy kiss. Greet each other with a holy kiss. Exhort one another. Hebrews 3, 13. So we have all this one another in the Bible so that we can encourage one another to say, hey, brother, I need to know if you're faithful. You need to know if I am faithful. faithful. You need to know if I am Pressing on with all my strength to reach the goal, to reach to that rest, which we're going to see um, in a little bit. We have prayer meetings. Do not abandon the prayer meetings. Make the effort to come, to, to, to come and pray with your brothers and sisters. Um, we, we need to, we have this tool, we have one another to continue in the race. Verse 14, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Um, that if indeed we hold our confidence, some people sometimes um, have used it to mean you can lose your salvation. Um, but the Bible doesn't teach that. True believers, they never lose their salvation. True believers endorse until the end. Um, so verse 14 needs to be read in connection to verse um, 13. And we have that four 
at the beginning of verse 14 that connects the two. Um, so he's saying like those who became um, hardened, they give outward evidence that they never trust in Jesus Christ. If you fall away, that means you never trusted Jesus Christ. They went out of us because they were never uh, part of us. So daily encouragement is needed. We need to call one another, check on one, on one another. Um, I, I would submit to you maybe this exercise, maybe try it, try it this week. Find someone, anyone, and find a time, 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 6 p.m., and text them. Say three things. Hey, how are you? How can I pray for you? And this is what you can pray for me. This is something you can pray for me. So you ask for a request, and you share a request. So try that, and on Sunday, we'll see what happens. Next Sunday, we'll see what happens. If you're okay, brother. <laughs> um, f- verse 15 to 19. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who are those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. The point here, sin caused unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness caused their failure and apostasy. It is not the sin per se that disqualified them, uh, because at times we, we sin, right? We, we sin, uh, but... 1 John 2, 1 says this, Little children, I write to you this thing so you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. So we know that Christ is our advocate. At the right hand of God, he's interceding for us. So they were disqualified because they stopped believing. Over and over again, God does a miracle, and yet, Lord, are you in, among us? Like, they stopped believing. They quit it. They stopped being faithful. So this, this story presents the reader with a bad example not to follow. They were, the readers of Hebrews, they were tempted to abandon Christ, but the encouragement is... You need to continue faithfully serving Christ, serving the Lord in that journey in your life, in your Christian life. Keep your gaze on Jesus Christ and keep encouraging one another. And that is every day. So now, and we, so now we are moving from the warning to the promise to enter God's rest. That is uh, chapter 4, verse 1 to 13. Uh, can someone read that for us loud and clear, please?
Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, so remember, the Bible uses um, different terms to explain the same concept at times. So the promise of heaven referred to the, sometimes the promise of glory, the promise of eternal life, <clears throat> the promise of rest. All these terms refer to like going to heaven. Um, <clears throat> if we define rest, back in verse 11, God saw in his wrath that they will not enter his wrath is rest. So, simply put, like the rest in that context was the land beyond the Jordan, the land of Canaan, right? Um, the Lord promised to Abraham and his descendant they will inherit that land uh, back in Genesis 15, 18 to 21. So here, the land of Canaan has two purposes. The first one, it is to point back to the rest after creation, after Eden. Because after God created everything, he rested on the seven days. On the seven day, that's what we see here. He's like, God rested, rested um, after his works. Um, but also, it has a future purpose. Um, it's a type, we can say a foreshadow of the future new creation that God will create when this age is fully cons uh, consummated. Um, um, so that's why the author is telling them to remain faithful because, look, these people under Moses, they did not reach to Canaan, but Canaan points to the rest of God. It's not this physical land where they're going to enter uh, into possession, but it's that spiritual land, heaven. And if you do not pay attention on how you walk, if you do not pay attention and let unbelief take over you, you will forfeit that Canaan as well, that heavenly city as well. So this is what it is in verse um, 11 in chapter 3. <clears throat> but in general, rest in Scripture is a metaphor that refers to uh, blessings of safety, of security, of salvation. Rest in, in the Lord is, I'm safe. I find a solace in Jesus Christ. I'm secure from all alarm. The wrath of God is, not, is no longer upon me. I have salvation in Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Um, it also, uh, the word means like to stop all your work, all your labor. We don't work for salvation anymore. Back in the old covenant, do this and you will be blessed. Don't do this, you will be cursed. You have to keep the law constantly and to be uh, pleased, uh, so that the Lord um, can be pleased with you. But now, we, we have our rest in Jesus Christ. We don't work for our salvation. We work because we are, we are saved. We keep the good, the good faith, we fight the good fight because we are, we are saved in Jesus Christ. So, we don't work for salvation anymore. We stop our feeble efforts to please God. We rest on the everlasting arm. We lean on the everlasting arm. Leaning, we sing that song, right? Now, we are positionally established in Jesus Christ. We are justified by his blood. We lean on Christ. We, we have found rest only in his life. Sin is gone. Now we are at peace with God. We can enjoy our relationship with God. Hebrews developed this picture even more by bringing out a, a, a unique aspect of Christology. Anyone, what is Christology? Not you, Pastor. You know. <laughs> the study of Christ. The work and nature of Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, I didn't want but, but a topic to spoil the answer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, part of, it's a part of theology that's, that, um, that solely focus on Jesus Christ, his nature, his work, um, his death, burial, and resurrection. So Hebrews 4 teaches us that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. 
we find our rest only in Jesus Christ. Not in a place, not a land, but a person. He is the one who gives us rest fundamentally, nothing else. So, now in the Old Testament, we have two types that point to what we call heavenly reward or um, heaven. The first one is Sabbath, and the second one is promised land. So what is the Sabbath? I'm not going to do like a long study on Sabbath. We have asked for the topic a few questions, and if you have more questions, you can ask him afterwards. But simply put, Sabbath is a day of rest and worship. Um, someone read... Um, Genesis 20, um, Exodus 20, verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. I'm sorry, verse 8. Verse 8, <laughs> eight. <laughs> sorry. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Yeah, it's a day, and you keep it holy. You keep it separated unto God. Um, so, the Sabbath is a type, um, it's a type of Christ. It's a type of heaven and the rest we will have in heaven forever. Um, so this time was to point to a future unbroken fellowship with God forever. So why don't we keep the Sabbath? Anyone, why don't we keep the Sabbath? Based on what I just said, it's a time of unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Because we, all, we have already started that unbroken fellowship with God, right? The moment someone is saved, you enter that unbroken fellowship with God. So we don't have to, okay, it's Saturday, uh, it's Friday, 5.30, okay, kids, get inside. Um, and wait until like Saturday, five, Saturday next day, um, 6.30. No, we, we are we already in that unbroken fellowship with God, we commune with him. Sometimes the, the relationship is broken because of sin, but we run to him, Lord, forgive me. Father, forgive me. I did something to, that is not according to your will. Please forgive me. But we already entered into that fellowship with Christ. Day to day, we have fellowship with, with, with him. Um, John 17, 3 said, and this is eternal life. He says, this it doesn't say this will be, but it says this is eternal life that they know you. When you know God, you have eternal life. When you know Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. That they know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And I put a note here, but I don't know why. As I said uh, this is the... In the Revelation, he said, blessed are, do, blessed are those who, who took part in the first resurrection. Yeah, I think when someone is born again, you are raised from the dead to life, uh, regardless of your um, school of end times. Um, but when you trust in God, you are changed. The old is gone. Now you're a new creature. Now you have fellowship with God, and this is unbroken. So you don't have to reserve a day to say, Lord, I want to stop my work and focus on you. And then, no, every day at work, at home, in the street, at HEB, wherever you are, you are in unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Um, we are united with Christ. He says, in the heavenly pla uh, places, our life is hidden in Christ. Colossians 3. Um, we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. We have knowledge of God through his word. And the Holy Spirit is applying that knowledge daily into our life. That's how we can walk 
in a manner worthy of the gospel, in a manner worthy of Christ. We have been born again. We, 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 we've been walking in newness of life. Some people, they remember the day of their um, conversion. For me, I, I don't know. I don't know the time frame, but I remember when it happened, I was like, in joy. Like, and I went out, I opened the door. I was waiting for the trumpet to sound. It was a different thing. And I feel alive. I feel, Lord, I have fellowship with you. So, the Sabbath was a symbol of something that was supposed to come. But in Christ, we have the real thing. Christ has come. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question for, of a food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are shadows of the things to come, but the substance is in Jesus Christ. So the, that's about the Sabbath. So it's pointing to an unbroken fellowship with Christ, and we already enter that unbroken fellowship with Christ the moment the Holy Spirit saved us. You have it all the time. Yeah. Amen, brother. So the other type is the promised land. This type is pointing to a spiritual kingdom. And that spiritual kingdom is on earth. Um, it's not a geopolitical kingdom. It's not, it's not like this is the land of God and it's not a theocracy that we're trying to establish on earth. But it's every believer anywhere in the world, they are part of the kingdom of God. We are all part of the kingdom of God. So the promised land starts with us here, but ultimately the fulfillment of that, the, the, the fullness of that will be when Christ returns. But uh, Christ is king over our life right now, right? He is the king. So we are um, citizens of heaven, even though we are here. Um, um, so any believers, any believer anywhere in the world, they are part of the kingdom of God. The moment we obey the gospel, the moment we repent of our sin and believe in Jesus Christ. So these images are pre presented to the readers of Hebrews to tell them the rest was to be had um, when Israel entered the promised land, the land of Canaan. But because of their unbelief, they did not enter that promised land. They died in the desert and they did not receive the reward. In the same way, if we let sin and unbelief creep in, we can forfeit the reward of, the reward of heaven. So we have to be on guard. Um, and we have to continue faithfully in the, in the race. So let's read verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering is of the rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Um, fear. It's not the fear, the morbid fear of God's judgment on you, but it's the fear of reverence. Um, it's the same idea we have in Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fool despise wisdom and instruction. Um, it's a fear that causes us to um, watch over our walk. We need to watch the way we walk um, because we, wanna, we, we don't want to forfeit um, heaven. It's, it's the same fear that happened when um, Ananias, he lied to the Holy Spirit. It says, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. He died. And great fear came upon them, all who heard it. So it's like 
we need to watch the way we walk. We need to watch, um, we need to be on the guard. Sin can creep in and cause us to fall away. The, the other thing is that they have the promise right in front of their eyes. But you have still a chance to enter that promise even though you sin or you fall, if you, if you um, for a moment, in their case, they wanted to go back to the old ways. But the promise still stands. And do not repeat the error of the Israelites. Verse 2. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not profit them because they were not united by faith who listen. So faith is the requirement of that promise. Faith in Jesus Christ is the requirement to receive that promise. They were not united, meaning that now we have the spirit. We have the same spirit. Like he says in um, Ephesians 4, um, there is one body, one spirit, um, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So they didn't have that, but we have that. We are united in that faith. But those who perish in the desert, they were not united in the faith. Only, you can say only Joshua and Caleb, they made it. Even Moses didn't make it. Uh, but they, they, they didn't have what we have. The Holy Spirit is in me and you and cause us to um, be of the same mind, be um, in the lookout, trying to encourage one another, hey, brother, continue the race so that we can attain to that rest. So faith is the, require, is the requirement to obtain that promise. Um, we have that faith and we are united in that faith. And the encouragement is the same. Don't do like they did. Don't complain. They were continually complaining, groaning. I tell my kids all the time, complaining is a sin. God was angered with them, and they did not enter the promised land. So we have that. We have the Spirit. We have the Spirit of God in us. Um, um, it's, it's the helper. Like God, God called the Spirit the helper. He is the helper, not it. God called the Spirit the helper. Um, verse 3 to 5. For we who have believed entered that rest, as he has said, as I saw in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. So they receive the good news. The good news they receive is not like the gospel. They receive a good news, hey, you're going to leave slavery, you're going to be delivered from slavery in Egypt, and you're going to receive the promised land. But the fact that they didn't attain or they didn't reach that promised land, um, that means they reject that good news, or they trample on their feet the good news. Um, in the same manner, we can trample the gospel under our feet if we don't watch the way we walk in the Lord. We need to watch the way we walk in the Lord so that the same mistake they did, we don't repeat them. So again, faith in God is necessary to enter the, God, the rest of God. God said, my rest, pointing to the seventh day rest in creation. We will enter that rest if we continue in the faith, if we continue believing in Jesus Christ. Verse 6 and 7. 
Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience, again he appointed a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So verse 6 is continuing the argument in verse 5. But this is what the author is saying here. Israel failed to enter the promised land. That doesn't mean um, the promise stopped there. The promise doesn't stop there at, um, when they could not make it into the promised land. And he's saying, if it was so, why is David talking about the rest like 500 years after Moses? So it's like, this rest is available today. It's available to you. And not only to, to David or to us, but for, forever, any generation, any time, if you have faith, if you believe in Christ, you automatically enter that rest. So he's saying that today the rest is still available. David, talk about it, 500 years after Moses. So it's available to you. So continue in the faith. Continue in, keep your gaze on Jesus Christ so that you don't lose um, that promised land. Verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God will not have spoken of another day later. So then there remain a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest also rested from his work as God did from his. So he's saying um, the rest that we have from the creation, Christian you no longer have to work for your salvation. I said that before. But God provided a, a way for you in Jesus Christ, in the cross, so that you can enter the rest, you can enter the fellowship, you can enter um, this community of believers who are the people of God eventually will be, will be in heaven forever with Jesus Christ. So Joshua, some people might say like, this is a comparison between um, Joshua and Jesus. Jesus is greater than Joshua because they did not obtain the rest in Joshua, but Jesus Christ gave them true rest. Verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God, verse 12, is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intention of the heart. So he's saying the same thing. Take the example, do not do that, but keep the faith. Let's strive to enter that rest. Be zealous. Do good works so that you can push through, press on, trust in Jesus Christ, stay faithful until the end. To the one who overcomes, I will give the right to sit on my throne, Jesus said. So, and he says, God's word is living. That means is effective. He can encourage you. He can, like, is the, 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 the word of God is um, the sword of the spirit. And this sword here, two-edged sword, is like, it's not like the big sword they go to battle, but it's more like a dagger, something that is fine, something that can pierce through heart, through intentions. He said to bone and can pierce through a bone, a bone and marrow, division of the soul and the spirit. It's not like a rugged, big sword that you've been battling, but it's more like a doctor examining like little uh, parts of uh, inside your body. Like the word of God is examining you, be, being able to go to the deepest thought, the deepest part of your heart to see the intention of the heart. Verse 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight 
but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So we all are under the scrutiny of God. We are, he says, we are bare and naked before God. We are like an open book. Why? Because God is powerful. His, God, His word is powerful. And like he says in Revelation, a sword coming out of his mouth, this is the word that is going to judge us. This is the word that is going to say, hey, you did this. Your intention, they were good. Your intention were bad. And books will be open. And we all going to be judged according to, according to, our, to, to the way we live our life. Every word we, put, we, we utter, every attention of the heart will be judged according to the word of God. We are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we will give an account. We all need to appear before the throne of Jesus Christ we all gonna be judged. Some people say the Christian will have the, the Burma, the 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 the, the bima, um, but I, I believe like we all gonna be there because the Bible says, hey, the tear, the wheat, like you're gonna separate the wheat and the tear. Those uh, on his right come into the um, fellowship of your father, and those on his left go and be burned in the fiery furnace. But we all going to give an account to God and be judged for how we live our life. That's the idea. The scripture, the, the, the word of God is able to see if we have unbelief, if we have, um, if we want to leave the faith. So that's why Christian, an encouragement to, uh, for us is to always be in our word, always be in the Bible, always be under the scrutiny of the word of God. Why? Because it's able to examine us to cut through whatever is in our heart, expose it bare, so that we can say, God, I sin, forgive me. Your word is true, and I surrender to your word. So in, in summary, this portion from Hebrews 3.1 to 4.13 was a big comparison between Moses and Jesus Christ. We saw that Jesus is greater than Moses, even though Moses was faithful in the house of God, but Jesus is greater because he is the builder of the house of God. He's the son. And with that in mind, those who are following Moses, they forfeited the promised land because they, they did not believe God. Therefore, if you want to abandon your faith, go back to the old ways, you are falling away from God. You are falling away from the living God. Don't do that. Stay faithful. Stay um, faithful until the end. And he was reassuring them that there is a promise of a rest of God because when you stay faithful, you're going to obtain that rest of God. So that's a big chunk from verse, three in chapter, from verse 1 in chapter 3 until verse um, 13 in chapter 4 comparing Moses, comparing his followers, and applying that to us, applying that to the followers of Jesus Christ. We need to be faithful. We need to be on guard. We need to do all these things, um, encouraging one another um, so that we can um, do the good works. Any questions? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that the warnings are there, but also you provide a way of escape. We can trust you. We can trust your word. We can trust your spirit, Lord. Help us, Lord, to walk in a manner worthy of you. Um, fight the good fight against sin um, daily, knowing that the promise to enter your rest is now, is available. And Lord, give us a heart for those who are perishing. It's a fearful thing, Lord, to fall into the hand of a living God. We want to have a heart to evangelize, to go in the world and proclaim Christ. Um, give us boldness and wisdom, Lord. As we, we do that, we want also to watch the way we walk. So help us. Help your church. Help your people, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.
right, we're gonna come back at 11.20. Thank you. As Christians, you don't have a fear of losing your salvation because we of, don't. Okay, so basically, because like what you're basically saying is that even when, even though we have 